Today I would like to talk to you about the throne of David. This is kind of a continuation from the last two studies I did, the sixth and the seventh kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this study, I'm going to be getting into more detail about this sixth kingdom, the kingdom that lasts for 1,000 years physically on the earth. I'm going to be showing you more proof that it is there. It's not symbolic. It's not allegorical or metaphorical or any other kind of philosophical term you want to come up with. It's real. Now, if you remember from the last study in the book of Daniel, there are five kingdoms of man prophesied. And the sixth kingdom comes, and that sixth kingdom becomes a great and high mountain. And on the top of that mountain, there's a throne. Like that. Looks more kind of like a lazy boy recliner or something there, but there's a throne there. Just kind of a quick little drawing of a throne. And this throne is there after the fifth kingdom is destroyed. And uh, the argument there that came against, the, that people come up with, I'll say it that way, is that Jesus could not set up a sixth kingdom because Jesus, Jesus doesn't work with the number six. Oh, quite on the contrary. Um, and you say, well, that's just your opinion. This doesn't match this, doesn't match that. Well, the problem is, uh, if you say it's my interpretation, then you have a real problem because the Bible is plainly teaching there are five kingdoms of, of men, and after that fifth kingdom, the part iron, part miry clay, the ten toes, after that kingdom, it's destroyed, and a kingdom is set up that fills a mountain, fills the whole earth, and that there's a throne in Jerusalem, and that throne has Jesus Christ sitting on it. That is the plain teaching of Scripture. And the only way to get around that is to deny Scripture and say, well, it's symbolic, it's allegorical, or whatever else. And you start to philosophize the Bible away, right? Um, which is a very serious sin. But you see, the way that this whole thing works out, I encourage you to read or to watch the other two studies, but how it works is there are five kingdoms of man. Five is in the, in the Bible is a number that's often associated with death. Sixth is an, six is a number associated with man. Seven is a number associated with God and things being completed. Okay, very important to understand that. So here's the interesting thing about this kingdom. This kingdom, uh, <clears throat> this kingdom is the sixth kingdom. Okay, but here's the interesting thing. Up unto this kingdom, coming this way, Till you get to this kingdom, there are five kingdoms beginning in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. He sees the vision, but this time period is 6,000 years. So this sixth kingdom starts and lasts for the 7,000th year, or 7,000 years till the end of the thing. So what happens here at the end? Here you have eternity. And the seventh kingdom. See how the Lord works that whole thing out? And again, it's, it's, this is not my interpretation. This is what the Bible teaches. If you take the King James Bible literally, this is what it teaches. We're right around 6,000 years, somewhere there. It's very un, you know, we can't be sure because of the calendar has been messed with and everything else. But we're right around 6,000 years. We are in the fifth kingdom right now, I believe. And when this fifth kingdom is destroyed at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord begins, which is, one day with the Lord is, is, is as a thousand years. We'll look at that scripture later. But the sixth kingdom comes in after the fifth kingdom. Uh, there's no other way around that. It's not, well, it's five kingdoms and then the Lord sets it up and then we don't really count from then on or whatever else. No. Um, this sixth kingdom, Jesus rules and reigns the whole thing too, I might add. Because another contention is, well, uh, that kingdom, there's no end to it. That's correct. There's a rebellion near the end of this kingdom that destroys the earth. Okay, let me say that. Right here is a satanic 
rebellion. In Revelation chapter 20, you read about that. The devil's loosed. The devil is in the bottomless pit for that thousand year time period. There's a satanic rebellion at the end and the uh, earth is destroyed. At the end of that time. Okay. Right there, I'll draw some continents or whatever else. There. <laughs> There's earth. All right. The earth is destroyed at the end of this final seventh day here, this uh, Sabbath day. That will be important in this study. But this is what the Bible teaches. Okay. Jesus Christ, his kingdom begins here on the earth, lasts for 1,000 years, and he, he's still reigning into eternity. There is no end to his kingdom. He puts an end to man's kingdoms here, the fifth kingdom. But then he rules and he continues to rule. Satanic rebellion happens. Fire comes down from heaven and destroys them and the earth. We'll see the scriptures in this study. And then he goes into eternity. His kingdom lasts through the whole thing. But you see, in order for him to work things out, with seven being the number of completion, he has to have 6,000 years of history right here for man and the 7,000th year for the Son of Man to rule on the earth, for God to complete the work of the earth there. Seven uh, days, so to speak, creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh. Six days and rests on the seventh. You understand? That's the system that's in Scripture, not my interpretation. I realize not many people put the whole thing together and they just kind of assume things and whatever else. Um, and when they hit truth like this, they just say it, it kind of boggles the mind of lost people and they don't understand it. And if you don't get this, if you can't say, wow, that really makes sense. And if you try to spiritualize this away and allegorize this away, then I have to question your salvation, quite frankly, because it's the plain teaching of Scripture. All right, now let's start out. We're going to see some very fascinating things in today's study. We're going to go first to Psalm 132. Psalm 132. And this is an area where the Jewish people, you know, the ones in Israel, uh, well, no, the true Jews are uh, black Africans in America or Native American people or the white people. Um, you know, Baptist churches in Arizona or something. No, they're in Israel, just like the Bible says. Okay, they'd come back to their land in unbelief. Uh, they're there. They fulfilled prophecy. Psalm 132. We'll start in verse 1, but let me finish what I was saying there. The Jewish people are messed up very much on the throne of David and the Messianic prophecies. They think that the Messiah is going to come in and fulfill everything at his first coming. Uh, they're quite ignorant of Scripture. And I'll be proving a lot today um, on this issue. Psalm 132, verse 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. Afflictions. Hmm, let's go and see what these afflictions are. Psalm 38. Go back to Psalm 38. We're going to read about these afflictions. Psalm 38, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. You get older and you're saved, you start to realize how much you, know, you get aches and pains, and you think, oh God, why is this happening? Oh, that's right, because of my sin and my youth. All the junk food that I ate and everything else, and the way I abused my body all my sin, and then you realize, oh, I pretty much deserve this. Verse 4, For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Yeah. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken, I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. I can't wear my glasses anymore because I can't see the page. I can't read. I'm getting this you know, thing now. I see old people, and they, they put their glasses down, or they 
We're doing this thing here. Well, I do that now myself. So I can relate. Um, my lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Another true thing there. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my heart speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. Now that one's not true about me. Nobody makes up any lies about me online. There are no websites dedicated to attacking me and lying about me, so I can't relate. Yeah. If you don't believe, if you don't understand what I'm saying, just do a Google, Google search for Brian Denlinger. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Verse 13. But I, as a deaf man, heard not, and I was a dumb was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Then I, thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. It's interesting because anytime you reveal your heart as a preacher, there's somebody waiting to stick a knife into it. I've learned that so many times over the years. And you'll get there too. I mean, you don't have to be in ministry and, you know, say crazy things and do crazy things like I've done. Just as a Christian, you'll see that. You'll see that uh, people, they're just looking for some little way that they can jab you. Verse 17, For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Saved people are sorry for their sins. You think about them from time to time and you think, oh, I can't believe I was so dumb in the past. And oh, I mean, you don't dwell on it. You don't just ruin your life because of it, but you think about it. I'll be sorry for my sin. But mine enemies are lively and they are strong and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries because I follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. And if you've been saved for a while, you can say an amen to all of that. That's a good psalm, a good thing to remember and read through that when you get really discouraged. There are other people out there that are going through very similar things. And going back thousands of years, King David did. He, don't, he knew what it was like to have people making fun of him and the consequences of a life of sin that you now have to live with. I hear people all the time, you know, right, man, brother, what do I do? I have this sickness, this disease. I'm struggling with cancer. I'm struggling with diabetes. I have this issue and that issue. I can barely sleep. I'm in pain. I don't know what. Mm -hmm. Well, how was your life before you got saved? Well, yeah, pretty rough. And I sinned. Well, then uh, go to Psalm 38 and get some encouragement. Uh, there's no easy answer for you. But you see, David's afflictions are listed here. And you see the reason why he has afflictions. Because David sinned personally. I will be sorry for others' sins. The sins of Israel. No, he said, I will be sorry for my sin. That's important to remember that. You need to be sorry for your own personal sins that you did of your own free will. Uh, stupid Calvinism comes out and, oh, God just preordained everything, oh, including your sins, your personal sins. I don't think so. That's up to you. Let's go back to Psalm... Uh, Let's go to Psalm 22, excuse me. I was going to say go back to Psalm 132, but not yet. Psalm 22. Now we're going to see an interesting thing here. Um, David talks about some problems, but yet it's not David. It's actually prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have David there in Psalm 38, um, but now in Psalm 22, let's look here and we'll actually see there are some things that he's writing here, a Psalm of David, and yet it's things that Jesus Christ fulfills in the New Testament. This is actually a prophetic passage here. Psalm 38 is about David's personal sins. This one is about what happens to Jesus Christ because he's dying for sin. He, was, he knew no sin, but he took on our sins when he died on the cross. Let's read Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's what Jesus said when he's dying on the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words, words of my roaring? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou, that inhabitest the praises of Israel. 
Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. If you understand the prophecy there, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. All right, he compares himself to a worm. You know, at the cross, at the cross, that you know, died for such a worm as I. That old hymn. Hmm. Very interesting. Verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ra ravening and a roaring lion. Um, like the devil. Hmm. Kind of interesting thing there. It's a bull that is like a lion. Hmm. The devil being an anointed cherub, has the feet of a bull. Probably nothing to it there. Uh, verse 14, I am poured out like water. Blood and water came out of his side when the, they put a spear there. And all my joint, bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. When did that ever happen to David? Never happened to Jesus Christ. It's a prophecy of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Remember he said, I thirst. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. He was buried, but he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Didn't happen to David. It's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Fulfilled by Jesus Christ and the Roman soldiers there. The, by the way, the verse 16 there, the dogs have compassed me. Dogs are Gentiles. Jesus was crucified according to Roman crucifixion standards. Hmm. Be not, but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. They're not doing it yet, but they will after the time of Jacob's trouble. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds, kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Sixth kingdom. For the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. One world order, a real one, not the satanic new world order, but a one world government and Jesus Christ ruling it. Verse 29. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. There will be people born in the time, in the thousand year kingdom over in here. The Bible talks about a child shall die uh, in hundred years old. So people are going to go back to they were, the way they were back there you know, in the garden, well, between the Garden of Eden and the flood, where they're living almost a thousand years. Um, it's a very interesting time period that's going to be coming to the earth, unless you're wanting to spiritualize it away and just say, well, no, it's not really there. That's a satanic Jesuitical teaching or some kind of a foolish thing like that. 
Um, if somebody comes out and says that this teaching here is Jesuitical, I would run away from them and whatever quote unquote ministry that they have. Uh, don't waste any time with them, in other words. Okay. Psalm 132. Let's go back there now. So we saw that Psalm 38 is about David's personal afflictions. But uh, Psalm 22 actually prophesies what the Lord Jesus Christ goes through. So very interesting there. Psalm 132, beginning in verse 2. Well, we'll start, we'll go back to verse 1 here just to cover it again. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. So Psalm 38 is David's afflictions. The prophesied afflictions that come upon Jesus Christ are found in Psalm 22. Uh, verse 2. Psalm 132, verse 2. How he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob, Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, <clears throat> nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids, until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard, heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. Now this is where it's very important. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Hmm. There's three very interesting phrases there. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, verse 11. Uh, thy body. Okay, who is that? Um, the Jews. All right, David specifically, but the Jewish people. All right, um, verse 11 here. Um, will I... It's the Lord speaking there. So we have Lord, Lord Jesus. And then you have at the end there, will I sit upon thy throne? So we have thy throne. David's throne in Jerusalem. Very interesting prophecy given right there. And it's exactly according to the premillennial system of teaching that the Bible plainly lays out. There's no question about that. Thy body, the Jews, specifically David there, thy in the singular being David, will I, the Lord Jesus, sit upon thy throne, David's throne. Now, if you just say there is no millennial kingdom, I'm a millennial, it just and wipe it out, and or post millennial or something, the church brings in the kingdom, and the Lord kind of shows up at the end or something. What do you do with this whole thing right here? Psalm one thirty two verse eleven. All right, let me write that down here so people can see that. Psalm one thirty two verse eleven. Right there. The Lord says he's going to sit upon a throne, the throne of David. Well, you know, symbolically, you know, symbolizes his throne in, in heaven or something. Maybe symbolically David builds the throne in heaven, uh, maybe. Or maybe the, maybe the throne of David back in the Old Testament was raptured up to heaven and it's waiting there, with, you know, kind of under a blanket or something. Wait till eternity and then I get to sit on this throne or something. No, it's on the earth for the thousand years there. Luke chapter 20. Go to Luke chapter 20 in the New Testament. There's some really big tie-ins coming here. Stay tuned. Very important things here. Luke chapter 20, verse 39 then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. And he said unto them, 
How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, interesting, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit, on the, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How is he then his son? Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. You know who the, who the scribes were? The scribes were the ones that came along and they said, well, you can't take this literally. And actually, you know, um, there are areas where the shades and nuances of the Greek would be um, slightly better translated if you were to say that they never give you a final authority other than themselves. Education is the final authority to a scribe. There's lots of them out there today. All right. Don't waste your time with anybody that says, yes, it's a, it's a plain teaching of Scripture that there's a throne of David and, and Jesus is prophesied to sit on it and rule for a thousand years. That's in the Bible, but it's symbolic. It's metaphorical. It doesn't, you don't have to take it literally. Go away, scribe. You shall receive a greater damnation. All right. Um, but Jesus refers there in verse 42, and David himself saith in the book of Psalms. Let's look at that. Psalm 110 is what Jesus is referring to. Go back to Psalm 110. We'll see this very interesting tie in here. Psalm 110. And how many verses? One through seven. Hmm. Seven verses in Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Talked about that in plenty of studies. In heaven, God, the Godhead, is separated body, soul, spirit. Three that make up one. Three parts to one being. Three parts to one person. There are not three persons. There are not three gods. Okay? Man is made in the image of God after the similitude of God. There aren't three of me. There's three parts to me. Body, soul, spirit. Okay? You can get my book on the Godhead Doctrine if you want to learn more about that or watch my videos about the Godhead Doctrine and you'll see the proof of it. This is a... There's a specific time thing referenced here because it says, until, verse 1, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Sit at my right hand, the right hand of power, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. How does that happen? When does that happen? Right here, there's still separation until he makes his enemies his footstool. It's all done by the end of this thing here. He rules on the earth. You go into eternity, and then they become one. All right, very simple. Uh, verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Right there. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh boy, get a hold of that one. Melchizedek is plainly Jesus Christ, and again, the scholars just go all to pieces. They don't understand it because they refuse to believe the Godhead doctrine, which the King James Bible plainly teaches. Godhead appears three times. Trinity appears zero. Okay, You can see my study on the, the uh, priest after the order of Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? It's Jesus Christ. There's no question. All right, uh, Verse 5. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill all the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. This right here. He shall drink of the brook of the way. In the way, therefore, shall he lift up the head. All right. A whole lot of stuff in there. But this is what Jesus is referring to when he says about didn't David write in the book of Psalms? And he did. Mark chapter 12. Go to Mark chapter 12. This isn't, you know, just little, give it to me straight, give it to me quick here, and, you know, I only have 10 minutes, and, you know, I want a 10-minute video or a YouTube short or something, one minute or less. Uh, this is sound biblical doctrine. This takes some time to flesh all this stuff out. Mark chapter 12, verse 35 through 37. And if you're saved, you'll read through the Bible and come to the same conclusions. 
because it's what the Scripture teaches. Uh, verse 35, Mark chapter 12, verse 35. And Jesus answered and said, While he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the Son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. You know, it's funny because if you're a common person, uh, uneducated laity, you know, um, you'll just accept this stuff for what it is. You'll say, well, yeah, this makes sense. It lines up there and lines up here and whatever else. But the educated, well, I don't believe that. I've intellectually come to the Lord and I've believed on him through my Gnostic ascent, mental ascent to the facts of the gospel. I just reject certain parts. But, you know, I, I believe. So I'm here and I, I don't understand. But, well, this here, this doesn't make sense to my, you know, uh, lost mind. So I'll just spiritualize it. Mm -hmm. The common people heard the Lord gladly. It's common sense. It makes perfect sense. The Godhead doctrine is something that's just, well, yeah, it's right there. It makes perfect sense. But the scholars, oh, it couldn't be that simple. No, it couldn't be. We have to bring in Trinitarian philosophy. Mm -hmm. Oh, believe the King James Bible? No, we have to have higher textual criticism, naturalistic text textual criticism. And what would I do without my shades and nuances of the Greek? I couldn't control people. I mean, think of it. Think of the horror. A, a church where everyone's equal and, and even the most untrained laity could actually be shown things from the scriptures? How would I maintain my power and my authority? <laughs> yeah. Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. That's a problem why these devils can't stand a preacher like me because I give you, the common people, the Word of God and say, there you go, it's what it teaches right here, it's what it teaches right there. Compare the Scripture to that Scripture. You don't need me. Okay? You don't need me coming and, and giving you holy blessings and everything else and whatever. You don't need that. King James Bible, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's all you need. Acts chapter 2, verse 29 through 36. Men and brethren, Peter speaking here to the Jewish multitudes, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, was he a prophet in Psalm 22 when he was writing about Jesus? Absolutely. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Right there's the prophecy. Psalm 132, verse 11. Thy body will I sit upon the throne, thy throne. This is the prophecy that Peter's referring to. Verse 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy fo foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's Lord. King of kings. Lord of lords. Christ, he is the anointed one. He came. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. It's right there. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Let's go back to the Old Testament here. Isaiah chapter 9. One of my favorite portions of Scripture. One of the most beautiful prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Godhead doctrine. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Right there, sixth kingdom. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, 
the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You get some of these dippy Trinitarians and they say, well, Jesus is the everlasting Father, but He's not the F God the Father. Oh, so you have two fathers? Okay. Sounds kind of Catholic to me. Um, no, there's only one Father. And Jesus Christ can take that title because He is that being. He is God. Very simple. Verse 7, Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. It goes right on in, into eternity. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, not his church, his holy church that's going to bring in the thousand year kingdom. We will bring it in with, when we all realize that we shouldn't fight one another anymore. Stop the fighting, start uniting. Uh, no, no, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Jesus Christ brings it in. Jesus Christ rules it. How can you get amillennialism with this? There is no throne of David in amillennialism. It's just, it's gone. You know, like I said, maybe it's a trinket that's waiting for him up in heaven or something to sit on. That's nonsense. No, he's going to sit upon the throne of David. Right there. Okay? Postmillennial. Oh, the church brings it. No, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. All right, right there. Upon the throne of David. You see, but, it, but the kingdom ends over here. It ends because of satanic rebellion. No, it doesn't end. He destroys the earth and it goes into eternity. But Jesus doesn't stop sitting on his throne. People are weird. Comes down, establishes his throne, Matthew chapter 25, uh, uh, judgment of the nations. All the people are gathered before him. And he says to the sheep, enter into the kingdom prepared for you. To the goats, down into hell. Down you go. Hey, marriage supper of the lamb. Let's have a marriage supper. Hey, who's that? Bind him hand and foot, stranger. You don't have on a wedding garment. Cast him into the bottomless pit for the thousand years. That's Satan. Cast him down there. Put a big chain around him. Whew, down into the bottomless pit. Thousand years are finished. He comes out, goes out to seize the nations. They come up to destroy the Lord on his throne. Nice uh, new anti-Semitic, you know, rebellion. Uh, he's not the real Jews, you know. The, the real Jews are, you know, these people over here. Some, you know, the devil's behind all that stuff. That's why it's the synagogue of Satan. Them that say that they are Jews and are not. If you don't get it, I don't know what else to say. Satanic rebellion. Jesus doesn't even get off his throne. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes them. And then what do you see after that? Oh, that would be the uh, great white throne judgment. Huh. From before whose face the heaven and the earth fled away. There was no more place for them. The earth is destroyed. And then there's a throne there. Isaiah 16, Isaiah chapter 16. It all ties together, brethren. All you have to do is be saved and believe the Bible and not think that you're smart enough to correct this book or allegorize this book or, well, I'll just, the parts that I don't like, I'll just make it symbolic. Isaiah 16, verses 1 through 5. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion, for it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday. Hide the outcasts, bewray not him that wandereth. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, uh, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler, for the ex extortioner is at an end. The spoiler uh, ceaseth, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in the truth, or in, in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. You know, this uh, 
woman, I won't go into the whole thing here, but back and forth with this Dana Ashley that the sermon was originally written for, a very proud uh, woman, would not be corrected from the scriptures, uh, kind of as I thought, messed up by Reformed theology and some other you know, weird things and whatever else. But she just kept going off about this whole thing of, of uh, there will be no thousand years of, of peace. There's no thousand year kingdom. Well, then you're robbing the Lord Jesus Christ of what's promised to him in Scripture. And she said at one point that uh, this, we're going to be judging. That's, that, that's what the whole th you know, thing is there for. The thousand years, it's allegorical and whatever else. We'll be judging. Um, and she said, and, and I said, is that eternity? Yeah, well, it's in New, Jer New Jerusalem. So I said, so there's lost people in New Jerusalem that we're judging? Chapter and verse on that, please. Well, you know, it's allegorical. It's you know, kind of symbolic and whatever. Yeah, you don't know the scriptures and you're too prideful to be corrected. So, big problem. Don't watch her channel. Don't mess with it, okay? Um, a lot of other issues I could say there, but I'm going to try to be nice. But this is very plain from the Scriptures. There is a sixth kingdom that the Lord rules on the earth, and He finishes off the earth. The earth is destroyed, but His kingdom is not. It simply goes from a temporal kingdom that is in time to an eternal kingdom that is spiritual. Son of man, son of God. Go next to Luke chapter 1. To the New Testament, to the book of Luke chapter 1. We go into this time period. A lot of people celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Anybody with any sense knows he wasn't born December 25th. I get that. But... To the, you can regard the day to the Lord and say, okay, secular day, but you know what? I'm going to remember this as a celebration of Jesus Christ being born and the gift that God gave. You don't have to. You can. Whatever. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Don't fight about it, even though some people like to because they're carnal and have major problems. But this is a time that you can remember the birth of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot that goes along with that. That's why I did a sermon in this very spot uh, talking about the unknown God of Christmas. A lot of people don't understand who Jesus Christ really was. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Uh, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the... What? Oh, that would be the throne of his father, David. Right there. The prophecy. He gets a throne. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. <laughs> well, you know, but it, it's ended after the millennium. Uh, again, that was the problem that kept getting got getting stuck with with this whole, you know, argument and whatever else. It doesn't end. The kingdom doesn't end. It transitions. All right. He's not going to rule and reign on the earth physically on the earth. Uh, okay, the throne of David is there for the thousand years, and then he goes into eternity. Well, I don't agree with you. We'll just have to agree to disagree and whatever. Well, you know, I'll agree with you that you're wrong. But I will not agree that uh, you have any proof at all that there's no throne of David and no millennial kingdom on the earth. Psalm 132, let's go back there. See, a lot of people are just messed up. You know, well, Jesus was born to die for our sins. Well, yes, he was. And he did. Thank God for that. But uh, there's a lot more to what Jesus was going to be given. And you can't just deny the 
prophecies all through the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, where they're referring back to it, there's a prophecy. He gets physical rule on the earth. No, no, no we'll just, you know, kind of give that to the Pope or something, and or we'll just kind of, no, it's the church that'll get it eventually, and just kind of forget that. No, don't steal from Jesus Christ. It's a dangerous thing to do. Psalm 132, verse 12 through 18, we're going to read about the millennial kingdom here, the thousand-year kingdom. Again, you know, well, that word term millennial kingdom's not in there. Okay, what's a thousand years? One thousand years, they shall rule and reign with Christ for one thousand years, Revelation chapter 20. What's one thousand? Millennial, okay? It's okay to say millennial kingdom. It's not some kind of a added thing. Millennial means 1,000. Psalm 132, verse 12 through 18. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. See? This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. Prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ ruling for a thousand years. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to look about the thing of the Sabbath day. And what is the point of the Sabbath day? What is it symbolizing? Exodus chapter 20, where the Ten Commandments are given. Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Six days, six thousand years. One day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Hmm. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. No, it's just man that's on the earth, and there's you know it's there's really no millennial kingdom. No, no it's Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, right there, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I'd rather believe that it's all symbolic. I'd rather believe that it's just allegorical. And what? Why wouldn't you want to just believe the plain teachings of Scripture unless you're completely lost? Unless the Holy Spirit's not there? I don't understand. I mean, it's going to be a blessed thing, you know, to come back down to this earth after we're caught up or with the Lord through the time of Jacob's trouble because it's not for us, it's for Jacob, you know. Uh, Seventy weeks are appointed unto thy people, you know, Israel. It's not for the church. But we're up there, come back down again, we're here for a thousand years before we go into eternity. Ruling and reigning with Christ for the thousand years, promised to a New Testament Christian. Again, I've proved all the studies, gone through all the scriptures, countless scriptures after scripture. Revelation chapter 5, 24 elders, we shall reign on the earth. Now let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Next book over, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall pro proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. I love how it says the Sabbath of the Lord, not Sabbath for the Lord. It's the Sabbath of the Lord, His throne. 
1,000 years, Sabbath of the Lord. Matthew chapter 12. You know, I try to encourage people to, to put out videos and things like that, but uh, there are some people that are real heretics and they really have no business opening their mouth about the Scriptures. And when they're corrected, they don't accept it. So, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and His disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and, did, and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple." Speaking of himself there, the Lord Jesus Christ. But if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Son of Man. Prophecy of David. You're going to sit on the throne of David, your father, for 1,000 years. He's Lord of the Sabbath day. Do you understand? Well, there's no 1,000-year kingdom. What do you do with the Scriptures here? Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 2. Now, I understand not everybody has had the, the benefit of being taught um, by some of the greatest preachers out there. I have had that opportunity. I've done a lot of study, a lot of research. I'm not some youtube -y guy or something that just, you know, I've watched lots of YouTube videos and now I'm an amazing preacher or something. No, I've actually learned and been taught and things both in person and through reading and through audio and a lot of other things. Um, I've preached in pulpits, you know, preached on the streets, gone door to door, done all the Baptist, you know, things that prove that you're a great preacher. And I'm, what I'm showing you, you can look it up for yourself and see it lines up with Scripture. But I get a little bit irritated when people don't listen and they just sort of, oh, you, you know, Keep praying about it. You'll see that you'll get, eventually get to my level or something. Uh, no, I'm not going to go down. <laughs> um, it's a little irritating. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, what, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was hungered? He and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat of the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was not, or was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Huh. The Sabbath was made for man. Who is it that's here in the sixth kingdom? Son of man. Made for man. Going into eternity, you have the Son of God, Son of Man, Son of God. Verse 28, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Right there. See, it's, it's such an interesting study. I mean, it's, it's so profound. 7,000 years, you have 6,000 years of doing work. There's five kingdoms in that time. Completion, earth is destroyed, sixth kingdom, comes over and transitions into the seventh kingdom. Seven, seven, perfect, lines up with scripture. But if you come and you try to allegorize and spiritualize and demystify and, you know, whatever else, then you mess it up. Luke chapter 6, we'll read the third account of this event. Luke chapter 6, go there in your King James Bible. King James Bible, not New King James Version or NIV or ESV or any of the other ones, the satanic versions that try to get you away from God's perfect word. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. 
And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did when himself was in hunger, and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone? And he said unto them, That the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. I just, I don't see it. I don't see it. Well, get saved, please. Second Peter. You would judge someone's salvation if you're questioning all this stuff? Yes, I would. Yes, I absolutely would. A lot of lost people out there. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. We'll begin there. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Right here is the system. Lines up with the scriptures. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What's the promise there, by the way? He has it already worked out, how the whole thing works. There's a promise. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, thy right hand, until I make thy foes thine, or thine enemies thy footstool. will sit upon the throne of thy father David. There are promises that are made to Jesus Christ. Unless you're an amillennial or postmillennial or whatever you want to call it, um, then you break that promise. That promise isn't really there. It's just kind of spiritualized away. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There you go. The final day ends with the earth being destroyed. A lot of people try to make it end back here. You know, back here between the 6th and the 7,000th year. You know, it ends there, and then you kind of have the new heavens and the new earth, and the satanic rebellion happens in New Jerusalem or something. No, it doesn't work that way. Verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking in for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Right there. It's going to be wonderful being with the Lord Jesus Christ for the 1,000-year kingdom. I can't wait for that. Looking forward to it. Son of man in Jerusalem, sitting upon the throne of David, great mountain that fills the whole earth. Seeing how the Lord restores the earth after the time of Jacob's trouble, destroys it. He makes a full end of the fifth kingdom here, brings in the sixth kingdom. It lasts for a thousand years before we go into eternity. It's going to be wonderful. But you know what? It's still all going to burn. Everything that's here today, all my possessions, everything, it's going to burn. Catching up happens. There's debate, you know, what's left behind when we get caught up. Uh, I think our clothes will be left behind. Don't really see any need to take our clothes with us. The Lord will give us something to wear up there. It's all going to burn. Don't uh, get to worshiping your things down here. Verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Um, watch out for anybody that says that Peter and Paul were fighting, and it, it was Paul brought in a false gospel, and it, the false apostle, and all this other stuff. I did a whole study on that. Okay, you can watch that one. Was Paul a false apostle, apostle or something like that? I think it was called false prophet and whatever else. Uh, no, Peter said he's a beloved brother. <laughs> and he's taught me, you know, this thing. So, verse 16, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, 
as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Um, I just don't see it. I don't see how this could work. How could there be five kingdoms and a sixth kingdom and then a seventh kingdom and this thing doesn't work and this because this thing is, this would you know, destroy it and this would it. How do you arrest it? You twist it. You contort it. It's not meant to be taken literally. It can be spiritualized and allegorized and it's metaphor and it's, it's not really, technically, it's, it's, they arrest it under their own destruction. Yeah, there's a lot of people that have a knowledge of God, a head knowledge of God. Um, I've stated many times, church buildings are for teaching lost people religious things. Uh, if you think that every person in church buildings is saved, then you need to be saved. Uh, you know, even if you want to make arguments for church buildings and, and whatever else, which are not in Scripture, even if you want to make arguments for it, the most diehard church building advocate, Baptist, whatever, you know that the vast majority of people going to churches are lost and on their way to hell. You know that. I mean, let's not play little head games here. Well, Brother Brian, there could, you know, there, there might be some that are saved and maybe they, they just, you know. Look at all the evil that goes on in those places. The devil uses them far more than God could or ever did use them. It's their own destruction. They rest the scriptures. They change them. Verse 17 Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. The error of the wicked gets you to deny the plain teachings of Scripture. That's what the error of the wicked is. And it can make you fall from your own steadfastness. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I don't believe that the, in the teaching of the imminence thing where it could have happened back in Paul's day, it could happen any time. Well, we're getting close enough now that you could make the argument for imminence. Okay? It could happen soon. I hope it does uh, because this world's about to fall apart. Uh, but to say that it could have happened 200 years ago, 400 years ago, 1,000 years ago, well, that's nonsense. Uh, that I disagree with. But the Bible plainly teaches that the body of Christ is caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble gets started, before the great tribulation, the Daniel 70th week, whatever you want to say there, okay? Before the Antichrist is revealed, the body of Christ is in heaven. How do you know? Because the 24 elders are there, All right? And there's a great multitude of angels around about the throne. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Redeemed saints, we go up, we become, now are ye the sons of God. The sons of God is a reference to angels in that particular context. So, well, you know, it's debatable. It's not debatable. There's a lot of things that are just simply not debatable. And if you really stick to the other side, the wrong side, and you just will not change and will not say, hey, I'm, you know what? I'm wrong. I looked into this thing. I've been praying about it. I'm wrong. I have to lower my pride and humble myself and say, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not going to be, well, I got another one. Let me just put a scratch on something here or whatever. You know, I, I took down another heretic. That's not it at all. I could care less. I just want people to line up with the scriptures. And a lot of people don't. And you start messing around with these false teachers, you will fall from your own steadfastness. All of a sudden, you're going to be looking for the Antichrist and the New World Order and all this other stuff. And Jesus isn't coming. He's going to leave us here through his wrath and judgment. Oh, no, what happens if I take the mark of the beast? Uh, you know. What are we supposed to do? But grow in grace. And in, in, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in grace. I try to. And believe me, if you know, oh, you're so you know, nasty and you don't smile enough and all this other stuff. <laughs> um, you know, you just don't have any grace for people. Oh, I have far more grace than I should. Far more. Um, I've been... Be backstabbed so many times in the ministry, the years of the ministry, because I have so much grace for people. Uh, I have, you know, tried to help people locally, in person, um, online, all kinds of things, and I just get taken advantage of over and over again. And you say, well, then you're, you're, not going, you're going to have a lot less grace for people in the future. No, probably not. I'm going to continue to have grace for people. Why? Because the Bible says grow in grace. That's why. So I hope that that study has been a help to you out there to get this whole thing 
um, so that there's no confusion there. Um, yes, there's going to be a thousand year kingdom. Yes. And this Dana Ashley with her channel and whatever else, uh, that's, I made the, I saw her comment and I thought, okay, yeah, you know, I'll do a study. That's a good point that she brought up. How could it go from fifth kingdom to sixth kingdom? That doesn't make sense. Wouldn't it go to the seventh kingdom because seven is God's number and whatever. And I thought, well, she's ignorant. She doesn't understand. And it's a good subject. I've never preached on it before. Never actually got the scriptures all together, put them out for the body of Christ to say, okay, I'll study along. This makes sense. But in her pride, she refused the whole thing. I went back and forth in the comments with her. No, and she said, thank you for a nice debate. And I thought, oh, we're having a debate. I didn't know that. I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. I, apparently I didn't, I'm, she must have missed that verse or something. But it's plain, it's plain. And it's a blessing to understand that our Lord and Savior is going to be on the earth. I mean, did you ever wish that? I mean, Oliver Cromwell, one of my heroes in the faith, uh, named my son after him, Oliver. And he, on his grave, it's marked, Christ, not man, is king. He wouldn't take the title king. He was Lord Protector there after the English Civil War in the 17th century. I don't want to be called king. Don't put a crown on my head. Only Jesus Christ is worthy of that title. That's a holy man. Whatever else you want to say about him, well, he was this and he was what he said there was right. But you know, um, I remember seeing the one time uh, I was driving someplace and, and uh, there was one of the selection time periods, you know, might've been with, with uh, Chump and Biden or something. It was one of the times, Chump and Hillary or something. Uh, but one of these selection times, it's selections by the way, not elections. They select who they want to put in. Whole other story. If you believe in voting, I feel sorry for you <laughs> uh, on that level, um, the presidential level. But anyhow, it was one of these times, and they said, I was driving past somebody's house, and they had out front a little sign that said, I vote for Jesus Christ. <laughs> I thought, amen. Uh, he's going to have his day. Do you hear what I said? He's going to have his day where he gets to sit upon the throne, and he dwells in righteousness and perfect holiness. There won't be any pervert. Uh, agenda that gets forced upon us or oh now he's confiscating our guns are you kidding me you know oh Jesus was ruling there for 500 years now a Democrat overthrew him or something <laughs> it's not happening not going to happen 1,000 years at the end the devil says let's go let's let's take down this you know Jewish you know whatever he's a you know Kazarian or something or you know they'll come up with some term and you know they're going to come out and let's take him down. We're the true Jews. We deserve to have the kingdom ourselves. Uh, whatever. Uh, one holy apostolic Catholic church. You know, he might try to bring that back, even though all the idols and everything are cut off over here. But maybe the devil will try to go Catholic again, you know, come out as the black pope or something um, at that time. And the Lord says, no, here comes an insurrection rebellion. Burns them so bad it destroys the earth. The Lord just says, okay, eternity. There's no end to the kingdom. Just an insurrection that he puts down just like that. Judges them, casts them in the lake of fire. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody. Now we have eternity. But you know, if we just went right to eternity from this, if we went from here and just skipped right over to there, um, I would feel robbed, quite frankly. Not a, Just forget the Lord for just a minute. I'm trying to make a, make a point here. Forget the Lord's kingdom. I would feel robbed. As a Christian, hey, what about my millennial reign? What about coming down to this earth and actually seeing the right things being done? What about not hearing the stupid, filthy music and seeing all the false cults out there and everything else? Hey, what about that? What about my time with Jesus Christ? Get up there and the Lord says, oh, oh, that thousand year thing. Yeah, you're supposed to reign. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Yeah, I know it's in the Bible there. I know, but it's just kind of referred metaphorically to heaven, you know, how does that work, Lord? It's eternity up here. How can I measure a thousand years? You know, after the first thousand years of being in heaven, is a little buzzer going to go off? You know, oh, there was my time to reign. Okay, then what? I mean, <laughs> there's no nice way to put this stuff. If you don't believe this system right here, what the Bible teaches, 
You either have rocks or brains, you know, newly saved or something, or you're just lost. It's just as simple as that. So, um, I'll have grace for people. I'm very kind in the way I write and things and correspond with people. I meet people in person, and I'm a very nice guy. But when I see you're crossing the scriptures, um, you're my enemy. Plain and simple. And I'm going to come down on you. I'm not going to be nice. I'm not going to go after anybody here or whatever else and try to destroy people. No, whatever. I have, I have enough things to do in my life. But uh, this is an important teaching. Very important teaching. Don't try to take Jesus' kingdom from him. Um, it won't end up good for you. So that is going to be it. I uh, really enjoyed this study. Uh, one of my favorite things to talk about is Bible prophecy, what's coming out in the future. Um, how long till we have this whole thing happen? No idea. But uh, remember that the earth is going to be destroyed. It's going to be burned up. Remember that in our holy manner and conversation. Don't get so tied into this world and everything else and your 401k and your all your other stuff and the, the new car coming out and the, this new thing here and have you tried that and have you... Don't get so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. I like to reverse that old saying. Um, don't uh, focus so hard on this earth. It's all going to burn. All right? So we will see you in the next study. And as always, thank you much for thank you very much for watching.